microphone on? Is it hopefully working somewhere in the back? Doing okay? I want to thank everyone for coming out on this beautiful summer day uh, to hear about a kind of uh, tragic series of events that happened on March 11th, starting March 11th in 2011. Uh, several of us have been involved at HUI and other institutions in looking at the consequences of that first earthquake, then tsunami, and then series of meltdowns at the reactors here, pictured on the left. They're situated right on the ocean on the coast of Japan, and I'll show you some maps. Uh, this just as an introduction was a shrine in Sendai. This is not the first time they've had tsunamis in this area, an earthquake certainly. This was built in 860 AD. This is about five and a half kilometers, three miles from the coast in Sendai, a city of about a million people. When we were there two months after the accident, what was striking is there was really no earthquake damage that you could see. So maybe some loose tiles, small amounts of earthquake, magnitude nine earthquake. Buildings were intact, uh, but certainly to the ocean from there, tsunami damage about three kilometers into the ocean was complete and devastating. So these things have happened in the past. Those shrines were set to kind of warn them don't build any closer than this, but of course this is now in the middle of this bustling city. Uh, so perspective on this is quite different over time. I also should acknowledge uh, our main supporters come from a private foundation called the Moore Foundation, uh, NSF and Woods Hole. And the way I'd like to do this in about 20 slides, 30 minutes or so, is kind of introduce you, this is a general audience talk to concepts of what happened in Japan and a bit about ocean radioactivity, because it's not just the Fukushima isotopes we need to think about, it's other sources of radioactivity. We had a research cruise there in June, early June, shortly after the accident. We'll look at data on the ocean currents, the waters, and the biota, the fish, and organisms living in there. I'm gonna talk about some other work, other groups about fish on both sides of the Pacific and what their concentrations are in those fish and a bit about the reactions in Japan, what they're thinking, and come up with a summary. So that's kind of the sequence of events as I go through this. Hopefully if we get through this, there'll be ample time for questions. If there's something that you just don't understand, it's really quick, just shout it out. Otherwise, we'll take questions at the end, and we should have lots of time for that. Because we'll try and get to a lot of different topics here. Now, I just wanted to introduce myself and my background by showing you the cover of a document. It was my PhD thesis in 1986. I happened to be at this institution uh, working on basically what happened to some of the plutonium in the ocean that was released in the 1960s weapons testing. Those atmospheric weapons tests dominated by the former Soviet Union and our country are still the largest source of the artificial radionuclides, man-made isotopes in the environment, which includes the ocean. So as we were finishing up that study, getting ready to graduate, shortly before that, in April of the same year, of course, Chernobyl happened prior to Fukushima. This is certainly the largest accidental release. We'll talk a bit about the differences and similarities. But I immediately kind of went from looking at plutonium from this 1960s event to studying the consequences of Chernobyl on the ocean, particularly the Black Sea. One of the differences between Fukushima and Chernobyl is Chernobyl was several hundreds of miles from the nearest saltwater bodies. The Black Sea was to the south. The North Sea, the Baltic Seas, which to the north. And so we went to the Black Sea and started sampling six weeks after that event. Kind of faintly reminiscent of what you're going to hear about today, or actually very similar. Uh, but most of my career was spent studying things like thorium, natural radionuclides, still keeping up some of the same lab techniques. But these don't happen, fortunately, very often. It was really, though, because of that history that I got involved. Uh, many of the scientists at that time, my mentors, people had already retired from this. There really aren't that many really oceanographers who measure these isotopes really more in the US in this field. So we got in train, wanted to take a look at the consequences. Well, I could show many more pictures of the devastation. We have to remember that uh, 20,000 people are missing or dead from the tsunami itself that impacted the coast shortly after uh, the earthquake. Uh, so far, no one has died directly from the radioactivity, though hundreds of thousands of people had to be evacuated. Most have not yet returned, and many may never be able to return. But the radiation itself has not caused the damage. But the tsunami that came in was really what started it all at the nuclear power plant. 
this is a security camera. This was not an intended photograph. But this shows a wall here. It's really hard to see the scale, but there's a ship here. This is about 50 feet high, wall of water coming in about 45 minutes after the shaking. Now, it's also interesting, I mentioned the damage was very slight in Sendai. At the reactor itself, there was really no physical obvious damage from the shaking, from this magnitude 9 earthquake. That was actually the original good news about this. They also have systems in place to drop control rods to shut down the reactor, the fission process inside the reactor. The same way in Japan, they're so well prepared for earthquakes that they shut down the high-speed trains. They actually automatically take elevators to the first floor to let you out. So there's a lot of systems in place to deal with earthquakes and shaking in motion, including well-designed, in some respects, reactors. What they didn't anticipate, though, is the height of this was much higher than the 20-foot seawall that they had set up. That, of course, overwhelmed that seawall quite quickly. You can kind of see the ship is now almost completely swamped. Seconds later, you know, these oil tanks, energy that supplies from the backup, are also swamped. These are probably about 75, 80 feet high, halfway or three quarters of the way up the water level. Right? And through the entire reactor complex, you know, cars are being jumbled around. The entire facility was overwhelmed by this tsunami water damage which led then to the loss of their generators, which are the backup power, so the batteries only lasted a very short time. This caused, even though they shut down the reactor itself, overheating inside of a reactor, when you break apart the uranium or whatever fuel you're using, you have a lot of what they call fission products, decay products, breakdown products from that nuclear process. They generate heat, they have to be cooled, even if you put in the control rods and shut down a reactor. So there was overheating and meltdown we're going to talk about the consequences that occurred because of the tsunami causing the loss of power. Another thing to remember is there were a couple ways the radioactivity was released. The first one we heard about and saw were these explosions at the four reactor buildings here, the puffs of smoke that you probably saw in the news. Uh, and this releases radioactivity to the air. Now it's coming out either as a gas at that point or because of the high temperatures, things that boil off, volatiles. And so it was different than Chernobyl, where a whole building blew apart and fuel was spewed, in that it was primarily an airborne release of contaminants occurring from this overheating and valves they couldn't open to release pressure. And so this was happening in a sequence that started earthquake here. Here's Fukushima, there's the epicenter off the coast of Japan. And here's a sequence of days. And these little lines are just radiation levels measured at the nuclear power facility on different days. And you can see this is about four or five days after the start. I remember that weekend thinking, oh, they got away with you know, pretty minor releases and damage. We hadn't seen any of these events about five days later when these explosions started releasing the amount of radioactivity. You know, equivalent at the site to about the annual background levels in the U.S. or a CT scan, not something that would immediately cause health damage. Again, no one has died from direct exposure who was working on that plant, but it became serious and more serious, particularly around March 15th and 16th, four or five, six days after the earthquake. And all of those releases are airborne. This is what's going to put stuff into the air, often called fallout back in the days of the weapons testing. So we have an atmospheric deposition, so you have small particles released and gases. They come down most efficiently with rain, and they're moved around by the wind. So normally the winds in Japan are offshore, and that's the reason for this number. They're very fortunate that the winds were prevailing winds were offshore, and therefore most of the radioactivity fell on the ocean and not the land. So for the direct exposure to the population, this is kind of good news. What happens, though, makes it kind of hard to manage at the time. They didn't have nice, nice maps like this. Uh, it was kind of hard to predict where it was going to go. They were making some projections. They were drawing circles around here to evacuate people. But of course, it doesn't fall out as a nice circle. It, fall out, it falls where the rain falls the most, which in this case is here kind of upwards here to the north and to the west. That's the highest activity that remains today in the soil. This is a map of cesium, one of the isotopes that is released at high temperatures. We're going to talk a lot about cesium. 
And these are soil measurements. This is a summary from a very recent paper of where it fell. You can see Tokyo down here, very low amounts of fallout reaching that area. Some to the south, some inland, more beyond where you actually think of, but primarily in this prefixture of Fukushima, it's where the atmospheric deposition took place four, five, six days after the accident. But what's different about Fukushima than Chernobyl was it's on the coast, it's on the ocean. The thing they were trying to do most uh, important at the time was to cool this thing down. This thing is heating up, things could have gotten much worse. Spent fuel rods were there, uh, pools that they were in were, were leaking, so things were getting overheated and therefore releasing more radionuclides. Any way they could, these are kind of fire engines brought in just to spray whatever they had, first salt water, then fresh water on these reactors. You may have even seen the helicopters that they'll try to drop some water like a forest fire. Very ineffective, actually. But they finally got hold of this, were able to keep things from getting much worse by spraying with whatever equipment they could assemble, bringing in these heroic efforts. They were called the Fukushima 50, people who were on site and basically had to deal with the aftermath in very uh, dangerous conditions no power, uh, high temperatures inside buildings, uh, lots of damage, physical damage to the area. Thanks to their effort, they were able to cool them, but of course that means this is on the ocean, a lot of that water gets right back into the ocean. So whether it's over the surface or back in the groundwater, we have a second source, which is the, I'm going to call the direct release. Uh, what's interesting about that direct release too, in terms of a source to the ocean, that didn't really happen five days after. The highest activity, as we'll show you some data, was in early April. It was kind of delayed. They were putting on this cooling water. Uh, the basements were flooding. You may also have read about people burning their feet because of some of the high radiation levels. That type of leak directly in the ocean ended up being the largest source several weeks, three weeks after the earthquake itself to the ocean of these radioactive contaminants. So two sources, atmospheric fallout, direct release, and this pathway certainly did not take place in terms of the ocean after Chernobyl. So that's a bit of the accident. You've probably seen some of that. I want to get into kind of radioactivity 101 in the ocean and what we know about it before uh, that. And this is uh, out in an issue of Oceanus, if you haven't seen that magazine. Uh, it had a nice summary of kind of, I think a background perspective we all want to keep in mind is that there's several sources of radiation, radioactive compounds in the ocean. And we will call some natural, we'll say human or man-made or anthropogenic. And typically, if you pick on one here, cesium-137, and you look at the human, the man-made sources, there are very large differences when we think of things like Three Mile Island versus the global test in the 60s and Chernobyl and Fukushima here in terms of the total quantity of this particular isotope that they release. The unit I'll use a lot today is called a Becquerel. Henri Becquerel, one of the French uh, founders of studies of radiation. It basically, it's one decay event per second, how quickly something's breaking down due to radioactive decay. I'll stick with Becquerels. To put these totals into perspective, we had to use a pet of Becquerel, 10 to the 15th. And you can see there was about 400 released of these quantity of cesium from the 60s weapons testing. Fukushima and, Chino uh, and Chernobyl are somewhere in the tens to 100. Three Mile Island was nothing, point zero 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 four in terms of the total release. Now all of these are dwarfed by what's in the ocean already from things like potassium-40, natural compounds that decay also in the same units of Becquerels, 15 million petabacquerels and uranium-238 here, and there's several others, radium isotopes, some of the precursors to radon that you think about in your basement. So we live in this sea of radioactivity and typically, and even to this day, the natural sources certainly overwhelm are much larger when you measure land, ocean, atmosphere, than even the largest of the releases of these man-made isotopes. The other thing you have to remember here, the dangers in the dose, and think of things like mercury poisoning. You know, you can have a little bit of radiation. One banana actually has 10 becquerels of potassium-40 in it. And you know, to get out to a sort of radiation concern, you'd be, have to eat millions of bananas. Of course, no one does that. Uh, but it comes down to 
our ability as scientists, we can measure even one of these units of radiation in our sample. So just because we measure it, we're not always concerned about human health effects, but we can use these, as you'll see later, too, to tell us something about how the ocean works and things. So we can measure very small amounts. Uh, the total exposure is very important. And so how that works, we'll have to also compare these isotopes to some of these natural sources in terms of the effects on humans and our well-being. So and that was that. Uh, another point is I'm going to focus mostly on cesium-137. It's a slightly different story for different isotopes. Polonium you may have heard of, uh, plutonium, radium. They might have different target organs. They might have different fate and toxicity in the ocean. We only have time to focus on one because it's one of the dominant isotopes released. Cesium and iodine that may also have heard of, very specific iodine to uh, thyroid uh, cancers and things, but it has a very short half-life, eight days, the dominant isotope that was released. So we're not too concerned today about releases of iodine as much as cesium, and we'll talk about two of those isotopes. So what do we know about cesium? Well, it mostly came from those 1960s weapons tests. When you blow up a bomb, you also release cesium. Soluble in seawater, that means where the salt goes, where anything that weathers into the ocean still goes to cesium. And it has this half-life, we'll talk mostly about 137 or 30 years before half of it decays naturally, half of it decays again. And so we're not talk we're talking about something that has an effect for certainly decades or centuries in terms of its uh, how long it stays around, decays of the staple elements after that, so we're not concerned. But we do have a concern about the concentrations of that isotope and have measured that concentration throughout the ocean for a long time. Now this is 1990 data. Different places in the ocean. I'm going to talk about why some are high and some are low. We're going to have another plot that's even more complicated, but it's becquerels, my unit of radioactivity per cubic meter. Typically do it per big volume because there's not a lot of radioactivity in the ocean. One or two of these units per cubic meter, thousand liters, something that's like the size of four by four by four feet square. It's very difficult to measure these low levels in this sea of other isotopes out there. There are places where the amount of cesium-137 is higher. You might be a little bit surprised here. The Baltic Sea and the Black Sea are because of Chernobyl deposition in 1986. Uh, the one that people are surprised about is the Irish Sea. There's been nuclear fuel reprocessing that gets releases waste directly to the Irish Sea. That's been going on for oh, four or five decades. It's actually reduced significantly since then. That number today would be lower. But it had levels of about 60, 40. Certainly at the time, 1990, uh, the waters of the Black Sea, the Baltic Sea, at those levels, it's safe to swim in, safe to consume the seafood. The doses you're getting are very small, numbers around 10. And certainly at these background levels everywhere else, including the Japan coast of about one or two becquerels of cesium in the ocean. So this is the status, 1990. So this is a plot that takes a little time to explain, uh, partly because I'm going to have to fit all these data on one plot. I'll try to, from this background level of one or two becquerels per cubic meter up to tens of millions. Uh, there's a timeline here, April 1st, 2011 out to March 1st, 2012. So this is basically one year time series. Every dot is a sample of water collected right at the release point of that reactor, right in the ocean, but wasn't inside the basement. This was in the ocean, sampled by TEPCO. Reported, we started to see data show up around March 22nd, shortly after the accident. And I told you earlier that the peak was actually a little bit later. This peak was on April 6th, and it was about 60 million in those units. Now, that's when you started to get worried. We were actually watching these data. They were released publicly. People were trying to put them in context. I'll try and show you some other numbers on here. But basically, at that level, you can already say that this was an unprecedented release to the ocean. And some French scientists, actually, if you took marine organisms and you grew them in that water for their life cycle, and this was only few days, you might have possible reproductive effects, mortality. That's, this is that. What was good and what they were very pleased with initially, and this goes down to say May and June, 
that the levels decline quite rapidly. This is because they plug that single leak, that, that spurting water that was coming in there. And the oceans, the first thing that happens, because it's a soluble radionuclide, cesium mixes down, mixes out, mixes offshore. And so you're going to, if you shut off the source, you start to decrease the concentration in the ocean, even immediately at the reactive site. So that's this quick decrease, and that was the original good news. They plugged the hole, finger was in the dike, started to decrease. They're taking lots and lots of measurements. They have many more points I can fill this up with. But then this starts to happen. And for something that sticks around for 30 years, this is not radioactive decay. This is a different source that's probably smaller, otherwise the number would be higher, but it's persistent. So we have a persistence here of cesium being released to the ocean much higher than it was for at least a year, and I've looked over last week, and it's still set numbers now at about 1,000 of these units of becquerels. So we published last December the first part of this record saying, well, this was good news, but we still have to be concerned about the long-term source. Again, unlike Chernobyl, a one-week explosion event, this was going on for a long period of time. Uh, I'm going to show you data from our cruise, but it happened in June. This is the range that we saw. The further offshore you go, we were 30 kilometers with the closest point, about 18, 20 miles. The levels were low and down to the background. I'm going to show you that data. I want to point out here that the highest numbers we saw after Chernobyl, the Black and Baltic Seas, were lower than what was seen in the ocean after Fukushima. But I also want to point out that what we saw offshore at these levels this was safe for our health and safety for human exposure. This isn't an internal thing, but just in terms of the radiation dose we received, which we monitored actually quite closely. Uh, we were within safe limits. And how does that work? Well, here's my banana scale again. This is the amount of cesium you're allowed in drinking water. These levels are so low. Again, we can measure down to here. The natural isotopes would be a line up here somewhere, passing 40 in seawater. So these are not of direct concern, but they are of concern for seafood. That's why I'll end this discussion today with talk about seafood safety. And that's something to be concerned about. Accumulation is something that you're going to eat internally versus external exposure to isotopes that are now at safe limits in the ocean. So what did we do? Well, we quickly got together what we could to get a ship, get funding that took private support, and a pretty heroic effort by many of people, uh, not just me, but to get a ship and a group of scientists to Japan. The Japanese were measuring, uh, at that time, some of the coastal values around them. But we wanted to get further offshore. So this is a kind of what we call a station map, where we uh, left Tokyo, went out, and moved our way back in, taking samples. Where every place you see a white dot. This big orange thing. This is not radioactivity. This is the height of the sea surface, and it's driven by this big current called the Kurashio. The Gulf Stream of the Pacific moves water offshore. That's why we went to the north. We figured that was going to be moving everything quickly offshore, and we had, to, we had two weeks of time to get our samples and go. And we took several buoy PIs, U.S. organizations, and international collaboration was important right from the get-go, both to get permission to sample in this record amount of time and to have some sort of intercomparison that our data independently agreed with other groups around the world. I'm going to go kind of quickly through some of these. We can come back to them. Uh, there's a the ship we were able to charter in three weeks from the moment we got a phone call that said, yes, we will provide you funding. The University of Hawaii left the docks, uh, had a ship called the KOK. It takes two weeks to steam across, so we were really trying to get there as quick as we could. We had already loaded a bunch of our gear on board. And we arrived then to join the ship and take what are pretty basic samples. It was mostly sampling trip uh, nets for plankton and, and small fish, the CTD rosette, the classic water bottles that go down open and close and bring water back from different depths. That's why there's this big rosette or carousel of water, uh, pumps to do some filtration. And then I'll show you a map next of drifters, you know, the message in the bottle, the idea you can put something in the ocean, see how quickly it moves to tell you about those ocean currents how that Kurashio was working. This is pretty standard stuff. Uh, there's more of this, I guess, in the exhibit center, explanation of what they do and how you sample the ocean. 
for me, having been doing this for about 30 years, the most striking thing was the debris we saw in June, a couple months later. We weren't concerned about our exposures because we were measuring those. We knew they would be below the thresholds that was concerned. But we were concerned about running up against some of this stuff in our crops. Uh, and that fortunately didn't happen and wasn't happening to a large degree. It's actually, you see the images of the debris is all kind of pushed together in the harbors. It's actually quite spread out, even in June, uh, pretty close to Japan when we were there. So I think it's about three or four data sets I'll show you from our crews. All those white dots are here depicted by colored circles, and that's where we dropped in a drifter in June and watched where would it go by October, and that stayed from October. And you kind of see these squiggles. This is classic oceanography. How quickly are the ocean moving material? This is a blow up of this area inshore where there's kind of these circles, and I'll show you the data for cesium. You're going to see the highest concentrations here. It kind of retains the water, holds on to that contaminated water closer to shore, whereas other parcels move off more quickly. So that was Steve Jane, a whole group of physical ocean augers, telling us how fast this material is moving. It's soluble, the cesium. How quickly do we expect it to get across the Pacific? So we saw a rapid transport of the drifters and cesium, and we saw these eddies where you get radioactive contaminants and the drifters caught up for longer periods of time. This was quite important when you see the cesium map, trying to explain this. So here's data that uh, published this May from that cruise for cesium isotopes in the surface of the ocean. I'm going to switch now, not to confuse you, but pick an isotope of cesium that only has only a two-year half-life. It doesn't hang around as long. So the only place you can get that from isn't the 60s. It's from something more recent, Fukushima. So by measuring two isotopes, you can fingerprint these waters and say definitely this cesium isn't left over. This was the new stuff. And the new stuff was highest here, numbers of 3,000, if you remember that log scale, uh, numbers that are less than three, which is kind of background. And I've colored the Kuroshio current, this Gulf Stream, gray here. You can really see how it acts almost like a barrier. And so our first conclusions, we knew a lot of this as we left the ship, was that there was a big range and we were asking ourselves why, and that's why we we're doing those physical studies. Why is it higher here? It's because of the currents. We saw the Fukushima cesium everywhere from within 20 miles out to 600 kilometers. And as we actually knew then, there was probably cesium. I'm sure there was cesium beyond this. We just had no time in two weeks to keep going. Uh, and this barrier idea that if the air was the biggest source to the ocean and it was bringing air to the south, we should have seen more down here, and we didn't. So for the ocean, anyway, that direct flow was one of the biggest sources of concern. I'm going to try and show you a movie. It's not my data, but it's an interesting way to look at where this stuff is going. Try and stop it here. What this is, the group from the University of Hawaii are trying to predict where things would go based upon their best estimate of those ocean currents. You saw the drifters. Colors don't be concerned that this is more highly radioactive. It's just it's a fraction that's above the water, and this is a debris model trying to figure out you know, why were we confounded by seeing so much debris here off Alaska, off the Canadian coast, as early as October of last year. Well, it's because some of that debris is sticking out of the water, the soccer balls, the styrofoam, some of the containers carrying the Harley Davidson. So that moves much faster than what I was measuring, which is the part that is in the water, the currents themselves carried with the currents. So what was kind of surprising in some of what's in the news is about the debris field, and that's moving, part of it anyway, faster than the radioactivity itself that's in the water and being carried. Uh, one thing about that debris, here's a picture of that dock that washed up on Oregon, quite a large piece, and so the concern Again, wasn't radiation levels, but invasive species that might be carried on something this large to the coast of Oregon and then interrupt the food cycles, the food chain in the coastal waters. So I'm going to get now into the biota. Uh, I'll go pretty quickly here, but we measured on that same map with our nets zooplankton, small crustaceans, zooplankton, and fish. Uh, basically, we're looking for things called the concentration factors. How much does it accumulate in biota? And we were focused on the base of the food chain. We weren't fishery scientists. And there's about a factor of 40 
more cesium in this case in the flesh of these plankton in their uh, body mass than in the water. That's a pretty small number. Things like mercury, uh, PCBs, pHs are much higher. Uh, because of that, uh, the levels were lower than what they were setting as a regulatory limit. And we could show that the doses from some of the natural isotopes, you're always going to give up potassium-40, but also polonium-210 were higher. Now, that's not the end of the biota story, but that's what we were looking at early on. Another story you probably heard about was the tuna caught off San Diego, particularly the bluefin tuna and their transport from Japan, their migration as they feed over here and move over, and these fish were caught off of San Diego. Of course, you know, that brings on the headlines, this fear that what we're catching here has Fukushima radionuclides in it, serving tuna with a Geiger counter. Uh, it does, I think, has implications for marine science, this type of thing. They actually want to use this to track not only tuna migration, which isn't very easy, but things like turtles and seabirds by measuring the amount of isotopes that are now being carried by them. Uh, the scientists, the authors also kind of joke that maybe the one thing they can do is save the bluefin tuna from overfishing because people won't eat it now. And they were pretty happy with that cartoon, actually. Uh, quickly to get on, you know, the results of that study were unequivocal. When you measure the 134 cesium in a fish, it has to have come at some point from over there from Fukushima. The levels that they measured were quite low, and they're safe and safer even because as they swim, they lose cesium. It's in their muscle tissue. It's replaced by the natural potassium in seawater. And so they just have less and less cesium. And that's, in fact, how they can say how long it took them to get over there. The way to trace that. It did demonstrate some rapid transport. It's difficult to go beyond this. There weren't, aren't many data about how this really works in terms of the different fish, different isotopes, and their variability. And the authors couldn't even tell anyone whether it would be more or less cesium in 2012. They're feeding over here in the summer months, and if they stay over here for a whole season, maybe they're going to accumulate more. And I'll get back to this later. There's really no US agency. This was, again, privately funded. Someone got a sample, put it on their detectors, and were able to measure the isotopes. As I get near to the end, I'd say the San Diego story is, is one about transport, but it's safe level. Off Japan, there's still are concerns about contaminated fish getting into the food supply. And the reason for that is certain fish, and if we just look at the bottom dwelling fish here, and we look at where they're caught, and these are from studies. These are not on the markets. Uh, and they look at the different prefixtures here going from north to south. And you'll see how much cesium is in the fish, total cesium, in each case versus time, March 1st, 2011 and out here to May 1st, 2012. So each dot is a sample from fish. Each point that I put this 100 line on there because that's the limit that they allow in seafood in Japan, actually in all their food products. So when it's above that limit, then basically fisheries end up being closed in these areas because of that. So they're continually monitoring for the safety of their seafood. They've had to shut down certain fisheries in certain areas based upon data like these. I have one more of these uh, because I think it's interesting to look at the different types of fish they've been sampling. They have 9,000 data points. They have Japanese fisheries, not my data, but I'm reviewing this for a paper in science right now. These bottom dwelling fish are the high ones, and we're saying that they're probably because they're exposed to the contaminated sediment that's in the ocean right now, not the lower concentrations in the water that we're measuring. So if you're bottom dwelling fish, you're going to have higher levels of the contaminants, in this case, cesium in you. If you're a freshwater fish, you don't have all the salt in that water, and the uptake of cesium is higher into the fish flesh. And so freshwater fisheries uh, and some of the fish farming has been shut down in Japan. Generally, the pelagic, the open ocean fish, and epipelagic surface ocean fish are below that limit. You could argue some of them are starting to get above that, so they continue to monitor that. And these were things like sand eels, and I think I've forgotten the other name, uh, some bottom fish, smaller fish that actually were decreasing. But generally, and this is what the point of, of this review that I'm trying to put together is, you know, they're not going down. So this has not ended the way it did for Chernobyl or specific tests. These are still high. 
They also range, as you can see in these numbers, here's 10 and here's 1,000 and 10,000 factors of 100 to 1,000 for any given day for any given fish type. So we're talking about something that's pretty unpredictable. And at levels where if you look at all these 8,000 samples, about 20% are above the limit. So there's still a fish contamination problem concerned because of internal doses of these isotopes. Getting nearer to the end, the reactions in Japan to this are things like this, where in the markets if they're selling products from Fukushima, they basically have to have statements about how low the levels are that they've been tested. So they call the Becquerel Wars. Instead of going for the lowest price, you go for the lowest radiation for your products in the markets. Uh, they're importing rice from China, something that the Japanese are loath to do. Uh, they're buying smartphones that can measure radiation levels. Afterwards, I can show you my iPhone attachment that does the same thing. Uh, but I think the general lessons before I wrap it up here is that you know, on land, the health concerns are far greater. Uh, there's a lot of rebuilding and cleanup going on, but basically that's where they have to concern themselves for human health. In terms of the ocean, though, it's many more question marks. The levels are lower. We still don't know because we don't have a lot of samples how much was released the longer term fate of some of these contaminants, and then these other sources, the rivers, the groundwater, uh, the bottom sediments. And then the seafood safety thing is a lingering problem for them. And once they're in the sediments, even if you shut off all of the isotopes being released, those marine sediments would be a source for decades to come of, in this case, the cesium isotopes. And there are many other isotopes released, lower levels, but some of them are quite specific, say strontium-90 that gets in bones and others, and far fewer data left on that. So I'll end with a couple comments. Basically, I hope you've seen this is one of the largest releases of uh, radionuclides off Japan. There certainly are many reasons from human health to radioecology to tracer oceanographies and predicting the fate of future accidents if we want to do this. I do like to end by telling people Japan is leading these studies. Uh, but more work needs to be done than any lab, any country can take on by themselves. Uh, and there's a value, and I think that value is here, this confirmation by international groups, independently funded groups of the levels, is building hopefully some more confidence back in the Japanese. It also gives us more science by having more groups out there making these measurements. So we've been actively collecting and sharing our data. And then the final question or comment really is just that you know, this is not in our backyard like the Gulf. Uh, I think it's an important thing to be studying, but we've had to rely on private funding almost exclusively. We got a little money from the National Science Foundation to start us off, but a cruise like that was over three and a half million dollars to charter a ship, get 17 scientists there and spend a year doing analyses like these. Uh, but I think we can't just stop now. And we see the levels of the contamination are still high in the sources. And I won't have time to go over all the names of all the people, but that's just at the end of our cruise, uh, feeling happy that we at least have been successful to collect the samples and wondering what we would find. We brought them home, did the analysis. Thank you. So we were trying to, uh, several people couldn't make it. We're videotaping this, so we have a microphone. And if you have questions, Put him on the spot, but we'd prefer if you would to speak into the microphone. Kathy over here can hand it around if you want to ask questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ken. Uh, I'm just wondering, there have been uh, some recent uh, unsubstantiated reports of genetic mutations in butterflies and moths, uh, which I think bears out your uh, observation on airborne contaminants. But I'm just wondering, uh, ultimately, that will uh, spread into the ocean, and I'm just wondering if there is any uh, research uh, given the limitation of funds, uh, on how much or what type of isotopes uh, might create uh, these mutations in sea creatures, particularly shellfish. Right. Uh, I have not seen that original moth and butterfly study. I assume, and from what I hear, it's quite correct in their analyses. 
how they identify exactly the cause of those mutations, I don't know whether it's Fukushima or something else. When I showed you the plot with the red dots in the beginning and some of the highest levels, at those levels they know from lab work, that's when you start to see the mutations, the reproductive problems in the oceans. We're thousands of times below that in the ocean. The difference is on land, that radioactivity falls, even though it's only 20% of the total, it stays put. It stays in the soil, taken up by some of the plants and things. So you, you have a long-term source at high levels on land that you don't see in the ocean. Those red dots became lower. I'm concerned that they're still higher than they used to be, but there's no evidence that I've heard of or even studied necessarily other than the concentrations in these organisms like the plankton, like the fish. And at the levels we've seen and others, we don't expect to see any sort of cancer, direct cancer effects on them. Consumption of us, of us eating them is a concern, not their direct health and say radiation effects in the marine organisms. That's not expected at these levels. I was I was intrigued to see the extent to which the, uh, uh, the contamination went to the southwest of Fukushima towards Tokyo. And as you said, it falls where the rain falls. Can you say more about that and uh, what the risk is uh, uh, upwind of prevailing winds rather than, obviously there's a lot of risk downwind, but upwind is what I'm interested in. Referring to on land, a little spot near Tokyo, that would have been a wind blowing, winds blowing to the south and to the west and depositing lower levels. That's when they were concerned about drinking water in Tokyo and things like that. And of the isotopes, the iodine that we didn't talk about was at high enough levels. There was some concern at that time, even in the areas around Tokyo. Since that has an eight-day half-life, most of that concern goes away automatically. It's really in those areas with the, the red and yellow colors for cesium, you have to decide, well, how do we mitigate the dose that you'd receive if you were to bring people back in there? And there's really only two things you can do. You can either cover it with something which is not practical, or you can dig it up and move it somewhere, which is also not practical. It's 150, 200 square miles in two inches of soil that you'd have to put somewhere. Uh, so, but from the direct kind of the areas outside of there, the numbers were just not that high again for humans. Now the freshwater lake study, I didn't show you where those came from, that includes some of those areas. And there are geographical hotspots, if you were, for where things are higher in some lakes than others. And they're mapping that out uh, quite detailed now. That's not unlike Chernobyl, by the way. There's certain parts of Scandinavia, other areas. The wind patterns of the day determine which towns in Switzerland were contaminated more than others. And so that's what we've seen on land. The ocean pattern mixes all of that out. You mentioned the, the drifters and the pollution, uh, contamina contamination affecting the ocean going from east to west. I'd like to know anything horizontal, I mean, north to south, uh, affecting other ocean to the Asian countries and things like that. A second question is, um, what's your uh, speculation or uh, the reasons for the, uh, for the lack of uh, major agencies to take, a, take, take this up? To, for research and funding? Well, I was just going to bring up our map of cesium. And really what the first part of that is, why isn't it going to the south? Basically the ocean currents are, are forming the barrier. If you release something into the ocean here, there's a current that comes from the north called the Oyashio, Kuroshio moving it offshore. It's actually quite complicated physics in here. That's why you saw all these eddies. But there's no, it's not easy for water, most of it, to get further to the south or across this. And that's why these dots are so much smaller in concentration than ones just to the north, for example, here and here. And this thing is moving like a snake, too. It doesn't have just one position, by the way. A wall is probably too strong of a word. There is some exchange. Now, there were some people in other parts of Asia that saw the atmospheric delivery, again, at very low concentrations. We actually could measure. <clears throat> on the roof of my lab, 10 days after the accident, some of the isotopes coming across the iodine isotopes because they're, they're rare. There's only one place they can come from, 
and they were at such low concentrations we didn't have a health concern, <coughs> but you can measure those quite quickly. So the only pathway south of here is through atmospheric releases and often going all the way around the globe <coughs> in the air patterns that drive things around our, our globe. And so there's some interesting studies by the Norwegians about how much was released from Fukushima by measuring in Norway, the arrival of that radioactivity in the air. <coughs> some of the uncertainty on the totals then uh, is, is based upon these different estimates around the globe. And then the latter part about the lack of interest, you know, it's, it's not for lack of trying. I think when you get into these ocean questions, they fall between uh, NOAA, they have the fisheries branch, uh, we have a climate branch at NOAA that does ocean currents, we have the U.S. National Science Foundation, it has the ability to get towards quickly, but for something of this scale, you compete against anything else about how the ocean is working. Uh, in NOAA was actually told by this administration that you were in charge as they were in the Gulf, and they thought that might mean a release of resources. But they are, uh, in their estimate, you know, so strapped for funding, they were not given new authorization. They didn't have BP to fall back on. And literally, it's not in our backyard. The EPA would have gotten involved if this was off our coast, but it's not in U.S. waters, so they're not involved. They all kind of kept saying, it's not my thing. We didn't have time originally to deal with that, so we just went right through where we thought we could find support through the moors. Now it's just become more frustrating because we're here we are a year, year later showing some of the fishery levels still being high. Maybe not off San Diego, but wouldn't NOAA fisheries like to predict some of those trends, tell us what's going to happen in 10 years off Japan and be able to learn from this tragic accident. And uh, they still haven't come up with, with any resources. Recently we've heard something about debris. You're hearing about the news, so we're trying to put a little bit of resources into the arrival of debris and what that might mean. Uh, that's not a radioactivity story per se. That's a question of invasive species and other things that might be coming along with that and hazards to navigation. Too. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, I, I spent time um, in the mid-80s in uh, Iwate Ken in Tano Hatamura. And I was just wondering if you knew, there's not much um, news from there. I was wondering if you were able to see two things. One, the devastation along the coast. And two, um, a lot of the people were subsistence fishermen and farmers. And just wondering if there was contamination. Um, you, you spoke a little bit about that, but both in the farming community and the fishing community there. I mean, most of the harbors in that whole area where I showed the fish are coming out of Japan, many of them were completely devastated. You know, as I said, 20,000 people, 100,000 buildings damaged or completely lost. Uh, so even the fisheries themselves, these are all those little dots that were collected are done by outside boats coming in now because there is no local fishery left in most of that area. Uh, farming, because of this, I think, concern, I was going to say fear, anxiety, that's a better word, of eating products from Fukushima. Uh, even if the products are considered safe, then people are not going to pick the Fukushima spinach over in some other part of Japan. So that's been causing a huge economic loss for farmers even outside of the immediately damaged areas, either tsunami or radiation. Uh, and then another kind of interesting thing I, I talked about, 18% of the fish are above this limit <coughs> that they're collecting near shore to Japan. Well, the government decided, let's try and uh, build confidence in our food supply. So they lowered the number that's allowable in fish this April of 2012 from 500 to 100. <coughs> there was no scientific evidence that said that should be lower. It's just a question of, well, we'll tell you that if it's below this level now, even safer, then we can put it on our market. Uh, what it meant is that more products became above the level because nothing has changed. The fish are just as high now as they were a year ago but actually broke down some of the confidence. Uh, that level, by the way, is chosen. This 100 becquerels per kilo of cesium uh, is the amount of cesium that if you ate something at that level for an entire year, your risk for death, death by cancer goes up by 0.005%. That's what that means called, another health secret. It's a dose of one millisievert per year. People might be more familiar. So 0.005% 
in populations where about 25% of people will die of cancer somewhere during their lifetime from whether it's natural or smoking or some other effects. And so they're picking a number that's quite low. You can eat a fish, I eat the sushi, I go there, I feel very confident, but that's something that they've picked as a threshold, as a policy decision based upon some sense of what risk is acceptable for this population. And they actually have a, a number that's far lower than in the US 100, we use 1,000. And that's, I think in part, the number was 500. They just eat a lot of fish, right, three times a day. It makes sense, it's how much you eat as much as what the levels are. And they consume more fish, more whole fish, and other things than, than we ever do in our diet. So certainly they've taken a conservative approach, but they've kind of confused people. And it's, there is no single threshold, right, below which you could say, make it 10 times lower, and there's gonna be another zero on that five percent risk, what's acceptable, and that's almost a, a, you know, a decision the government's trying to make for people, that people have a hard time with radiation risk because we can't taste it, we can't feel it, we can't smell it, and if there's something that's out there, we have no control over this accident, and certainly there's a, a lot of damage to clean up, it's also related that to reduce those levels as low as reasonably achievable is kind of the term they use. I have a question. You talked about natural occurring radioactivity. Is there a difference between what was released in the accident versus what's occurring naturally? Is one more dangerous than the other? There are specific isotopes that are more dangerous that are natural. Polonium-210 happens to be one. It's a big alpha emitter. There are things that can be emitted that are man-made that might be more toxic. Plutonium happens to be one. So there's a whole range of different radiation decay pathways this thing called alpha, beta, or gamma radiation, different energies, so it's like this big whole mix of toxic organic compounds. They all have their different properties in the environment and effects on humans and target organs. So it's really hard to say, but it's not, you can't categorically, categorically say that the man-made ones are more dangerous than the natural isotopes. Potassium-40 I talked about a lot. That's a pretty high energy beta decay, similar to cesium-137, uh, so not that different. A lot of our job in the lab, by the way, is separating them so we can actually see the cesium in the background of other isotopes that are there. We have to chemically separate it from the other isotopes because they're more abundant. And we continue to wrestle with how you do that and work sometimes in clean bunny suits and clean rooms to make sure we don't introduce dust that might be higher in the radiation signal we're looking for than our samples in the deep ocean or Uh, one more. I was wondering if uh, the Pilgrim plant, uh, if the company has been interested in your findings, if that's been a direct communication to you at all or recommendations from you to them? Uh, I've not been either asked for uh, comments or been in contact with them. Uh, I actually expect that the fisheries were the people who were going to get to us first and say, can you tell the world that the fish were safe or something? Uh, but they also haven't been involved as much. I think the US FDA just looks at fish, measures what comes in the container and does you know, the cursory sampling. Is it above a certain threshold? And they basically, uh, there's been import restrictions from all of those areas where they saw the highest contamination. Now, so as long as they're doing their job in restricting those fisheries, I think that's working. As far as the reactor operators, no. I mean, I think there's been reviews, and I'm not a specialist at all, either in reactor design or safety. I know there's been reviews in this country and now in Japan, and they've in fact shut down all of their nuclear re reactors until recently they restarted a couple of them, but because of concerns that whether they had the measures in place to stop this overheating type of accident from happening again. Hi, Ken, that's splendid work. What I'm thinking of is the additive uh, sources that have to be considered. Um, for instance, from the atmosphere, was there uh, what was blown over into the West Coast? And a second um, question I would have would be um, 
the Jojo current must ha uh, uh, bring off rings and so forth that can go either into the contaminated area or even spin then from there and bring stuff, uh, uh, <coughs> nuclear material, to the south of the current. It's, it's a way to get over. And then there's a third concern is I've had is uh, the fact that um, there seem to be raised mortalities on the western, our northwest in the United States in terms of the mortality of babies uh, one year and less uh, three months after Fukushima, the mortality rate was 35% uh, greater than uh, the previous numbers that they've gotten. There's absolutely no way of knowing uh, cause and effect. And the people who wrote this up were very careful to say that the actual cause couldn't be determined but maybe you speak to something about the atmospheric dust and so forth and, and uh, the, the rings and how, how do we find cause and effect? Yeah, I mean, the consequences of the atmospheric like delivery here result in, well, we often use the word insignificant. Yes, you can measure the isotope in the air and found that that came over. But compared to any other dose we're exposed to, it's uh, bringing out my Geiger counter here. It's unmeasurable in terms of what you're receiving, either through radon that's in the air naturally or from cosmic radiation that's exposed to. People are getting on planes leaving the west coast to come east, and the one place where my Geiger counter really got high is up in high altitude in a plane and exposed to higher levels of cosmic radiation. It's not poo poo radiation spheres and other things, but it's, it's just a fact that these are pretty small. Uh, the last part you're getting at, I wanted to address. The last. Oh, this this study. No, this study. There's one study out there by what should be by the the degrees reputable uh, statistical analyses of some of the death rates, and that's been actually completely disproven by their uh, other scientists who look at the same data over longer periods and see no statistical evidence for an increase in mortality. And one way to think about it, if there was mortality increases here, they'd be huge in Japan not seeing that, you're not hearing about that. No direct effects. In Japan, what they're concerned about, they're tallying up uh, like an anxiety death. There's a term in Japanese, I don't speak Japanese, but uh, for the people who as a consequence of this accident, the evacuation, there's more suicides where they were moved so quickly that they uh, suffered health effects. That number, the estimate I've seen is about 1,500 people that they're attributing now to more of the evacuation, the anxiety, the stress that's come with that. And that's in fact, Kind of what they've seen post Chernobyl over the years, that more deaths of people who have been displaced ne may never get to move back to their homes, uh, things like that, that's causing premature death. It's not the radiation directly itself. And in this case, the Fukushima 50, no one's died directly who was fighting these uh, fires and trying to put them out. Unlike Chernobyl, when people died from acute radiation exposure, that's a level even higher than the red dot. There is concern for the people there and when they can move back and the health effects of that more so than direct exposure. And certainly not mortality here based upon anything I've been able to read. I'm just wondering about the, uh, the corium and whether anything you detected in the water was coming from the core, the meltdown? It's a good question. Most of that atmospheric release would be gases or things that become volatile, high temperatures boil off. And when you talk about core, what I'm thinking of are things like plutonium and uranium, things that actually the fuel themselves that in Chernobyl, when that exploded, got spewed out as far as Kiev. We've actually seen, a, I'd say, a trace amount of plutonium. I've seen two talks on that. One was from my group. And that's a core reactor material that doesn't come out as a gas that's in the ocean, uh, probably because of all that cooling water that gets put on there. Because hydrogen makes it very acidic, if you know a bit about chemistry, so it basically dissolves some of the materials. 
and bring that back into the ocean. A very, very small increase, but uh, we haven't yet uh, taken that into some of the seafood and the sediments. We're actually a student just went off to catch her shuttle back. She's working on some of the first sediment samples in my lab to measure things like plutonium and other isotopes beyond that wouldn't be released in the air, but may have come out in the hot acidic water that's been still to this day, by the way, they're putting on hundreds of tons of water per day to cool those reactors and only recovering about half of that water by a process for where they strip out the cesium and, and dispose of it somewhere. So that's why those red dots are dropping off to zero, is because they have to cool that thing for decades, for years certainly, and that takes water and they've got leaks everywhere. Thanks very much. I just wondered, in, uh, if you analyze a body of water like Cape Cod Bay and a nuclear p plant like the Pilgrim plant, how might the water act in that kind of a, a current system where I assume there isn't a major current either taking water away or how would the water, you know, is the water more standing? Uh, so would the residues remain? in that kind of a ocean environment? Yeah, I think there's two ways I could answer, answer that. One is, you know, we did measure, we tried to measure in Whithole, could not see Fukushima isotopes, nor could we see them further out in the Atlantic. So the amount that was delivered from Fukushima, I know that's not exactly your question, was not measurable. We actually could see Chernobyl isotopes here off the docks of Whithole. Uh, your comment about ocean currents, one reason the black sea levels were so high is that it's a confined body with very little in input and output of water, so it kind of held on to it, sort of like those little eddies off the coast of Japan. So ocean currents do determine, uh, in the short and long term, where these things will end up. And I use this word tracer oceanography at the end, is what we might do next in the Pacific, is use these as a way to kind of see how fast the currents are moving, even if the levels are safe, they can tell us something about mixing and uh, how quickly the deep water in the Pacific gets replaced in the surface water and other work that we have about climate change and the ocean's capacity to pick up anthropogenic gases. So there's kind of the, the silver line in some of these things like the testing in the 60s is that oceanographers take advantage of these to learn about how the ocean works and that can certainly happen in this case. Uh, still a health concern, Japanese seafood, but offshore we are working with some of the physical oceanographers to say how can we learn about specific current speed by measuring radio nuclides in the ocean with this unique fingerprint of Fukushima on top of what was there before. So there's things like that. But it does make a difference, the ocean currents, in terms of maintaining levels and mixing them out. I think we're gonna, I'll, I can stay up here if you wanna come up. Uh, I can display what a iPhone Geiger counter looks like uh, to you. And sample some mud from Fukushima. Thank you, Ken. Before everyone leaves, I know a lot of people had to take off already. I just wanted to remind folks that we do have an electronic newsletter that you, comes out monthly. We'll let you know about ta series talks like this, as well as public events that we have. And on September 8th, the Saturday, we're having a public event um, on Titanic. So just if you want to learn more, log in and sign up. Thanks.